observations and then we'll talk about the implications for that sea level rise geodetic faults and geologic faults discovery um, what the heck is geodesy <laughs> does anyone know anyone let a student answer anyone yeah. <laughs> yeah. anyone have a, a guess about what geodesy is Geo, okay, we've got two, we've got geo, so what does that have to do with? Odd. 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 Earth, all right, so, um, deadics, all right, whatever, it's the study of the Earth's moving, okay, like, uh, you know, trans dance, okay, but for the Earth. Okay, so now first, we're going to do some exercises, because it's dark, and it's, you know, winter time, I love the weather today, it's the best weather we've had yeah. in at least a year. So we're going to do some exercising. So we're going to take our fingers and attach it, our fingers to our wrist like Velcro. And this is the subduction zone, the finger wrist model of the subduction zone where we have a down going plate. And so I'm going to move our elbows together and keep our fault locked, but our arms going to flex. So as the plates are moving together, you'll see my fingers are going down and my wrist is going up. Now what's going to happen during the earthquake when that fault slips? What happened to my fingers? Bubbles. That's right, the fingers go up and the wrist goes down. So we have this inchworm cycle, right? The finger wrist model. So in between earthquakes, the wrist goes up. During earthquakes, the wrist goes down. So we'll just keep that in mind. Here's a map of, the, of uh, California, Oregon, and Washington, and uh, showing some of our plate boundary faults, including the player here, the Cascadia subduction zone. Here's cross section, 8A prime. Here's our in between earthquake. 
where our risk is going up. Here's our cooperatively, during the earthquake, our risk is going down. So that's sort of like the subduction zone earthquake cycle. And here's another, I always like to show a couple ways of, of looking at things. Here's a fantastic figure from Brian Atwater. And show, so here we have the inner seismic and the co-seismic periods. And here again, our fingers are, are being pulled down and our wrist is bulging up in between earthquakes. And then during earthquakes, our fingers go up and that's what lifts the water column up. And then that water has some gravitational potential. It falls back down and oscillates and that's what causes a tsunami. Okay, so there's our introduction. And so this is one of the, from one of the papers where we made this discovery uh, from Wayne Thatcher in 1984. And this, there's this uh, subduction zone earthquake in Japan. There's a pair of earthquakes. This is one of them, the Nankai earthquake. And on the vertical axis, we have vertical land motion, and this is distance from the fault. So you can, so you can think of, oh, this is the wrist going down. This is co-seismic motion. So this is the fingers went up and the wrist went down. And if we invert that, all right, so I just turned it upside down, and we compare that to the inner seismic data, survey data, so we can see that they are kind of inversions of each other, the opposites of each other. So that's really interesting. Uh, we also observed this in, uh, uh, in uh, 1964, Alaska uh, had a subduction zone earthquake. This area is the finger part of the subduction zone. This is the wrist part of the subduction zone. So the wrist went down, the finger went up. Same thing happened in Chile. Same thing happened in Japan in 2011. This is a photo from Sotake-san. And we can see these areas. I can tell you that these areas were above sea level before the earthquake. But uh, they're not above sea level very much now. And I really like this photo because it reminds me of Humboldt Bay and the Eel River. So we have Arcata Bay, South Bay, Eureka, Arcata, and this is the Eel River Valley. So it's a really great analogy of what might, we might imagine our landscape to look like af after an earthquake here. So not only do we have historic anal, uh, knowledge of earthquakes causing vertical land motion, we can look into the past, into prehistoric evidence. So imagine you're a happy tree. You're living close to sea level, right along Humboldt Bay, but you're above sea level. So you're a happy tree, you get fresh water, you're on the wrist part of the subduction zone. So during the earthquake, the ground goes down, you get, bare, you get uh, salt water intrusion, and you're not a happy tree anymore, so you die. And, uh, but you're going to have some friends soon, but you die, you get buried in mud, and the mud fills in, and you're on the wrist, it goes up, until you start growing plants again. So we found evidence like this, stratigraphic evidence, these layers, in many different locations along the subduction zone. Well, here's a photo that I did not take. Brian Atwater might have taken this. It's in his paper. These are some tree stumps, and they have barnacles on them. Do barnacles grow on trees? No. So these trees used to be out of the, you know, above sea level but now they aren't. So this is one of the, we call this a ghost forest. So this is one of the ghost forests. There are numbers of ghost forests along um, the coast of Oregon. Here's a photo I took up in Alaska. This is just uh, east of Anchorage. And so here's some famous geologists. Uh, here's Carrie C. Um, and this is Peggy, actually, from Berkeley. Here's Rick Kaler. And uh, this is a, a tree that was happy before the earthquake in 1964. And this is the soil that that tree is still rooted in. And we can see that it's not alive anymore, right? So subsided, co-seismic substance, the tree died. And then since then, it's filled in with sediment and the ground has gone up. And behind these uh, fine geologists are some growing trees. So it's already growing again and that was only a few decades ago. Um, so Brian Atwater, excuse me, uh, published a summary compilation of the work that's been done in Cascadia. And at this location, each of these horizontal lines is one of those buried soils. And uh, 
each of these buried soils coincides to one of these vertical lines here. So this plot goes from today back about 3,500 years ago, and this represents that land level going up, going down, going up, going down. So each of these is an earthquake, and so we have a prehistoric earthquake here, and we'll, uh, I think this might be Willapa Bay, and uh, I can't remember, um, but we have uh, records like this all up and down the coast. This is pretty sharp. And, uh, and this is free to download. You can also learn about uh, the tsunami that went all the way to Japan from the last earthquake, the 1700 AD uh, subduction zone earthquake. So download it. Um, so back in 2005, we had, again, we have all these different sites, uh, but the soils, these buried soils are discontinuous. We can't link them from <laughs> site to site. So we didn't know if um, the entire subduction zone went off at once, or if we, it went off in little pieces. So we call this the dinner sausage breakfast link uh, debate. <laughs> and so uh, it wasn't until a little while later that we discovered that there were submarine landslides out here in the deep sea, and we could correlate those deposits. And then we were able to link some of the earthquakes along strike and so uh, here's a figure showing that the subduction zone ruptures in these different segments. And so these are uh, the different segments. So sometimes the earthquake ruptures this far, or sometimes twice it's ruptured that far. So this is sort of you know, a uh, state of knowledge about the earthquake history in Cascadia. And so you can see down here, uh, we have Cascadia subduction zone earthquakes maybe less than every 200 years. Okay, well also, um, I mentioned tsunamis, if, uh, if there's a set, set source of sediment, that sediment might get transported and then deposited on this buried soil, so, and then entombed. And so here's an example of this uh, grass plant that's been entombed in these tsunami layers. See, there are all these tsunami layers. So that's, that's out there too. So I just want to review that, because here in Hubble Bay, here's a map that I uh, personally communicated to myself. <laughs> and each green dot represents a core that we have evidence for that co-seismic substance. However, in most of Humboldt Bay, we don't have red dots, which represent positive evidence for tsunami deposits. And in the Eel River Valley, there are lots of cores. These are just some representative ones. And we think that there are lots of tsunami deposits uh, Wen Hao Li, in his master's thesis, um, documented that there are potentially some tsunami deposits there. So I'm going to be pushing forward to have to go collect some cores um, as part of my new job. And so here's one of the cores I collected for my master's thesis with uh, Harvey Kelsey as my advisor. And here is that nice soil, buried soil, with this tsunami deposit on top of it. You can see the little sand grains. I'm not going to go into that anymore. But uh, because of this, we've developed a tsunami hazard maps through time and then a tsunami evacuation map uh, prepared by the Redwood Coast Tsunami Group. Work group. Okay, so that's all intro. Let's talk about some of our observations and interpretations. Let's see a little change. So over time, we go into we have glacial periods and interglacial periods. Are we in a glacial period right now? No, no. <laughs> we're in an interglacial period. So the ice is melted, well it's still melting, and sea level's <laughs> higher. So here's today, here's 140 grand ago, sea level's high. About 20,000 years ago, sea level was lower because we were in a glacial period. The glaciers melted and it rose rapidly till about 6,000 years ago. Then it tapered off and it rose about a millimeter a year, millimeter and a half a year since 6,000 years ago. The records are different around the globe, but that's the sort of like the big picture. I'd like to um, mention the last time, the last major interglacial, 120 grand ago, the sea level was higher than it is now. It was between two and five meters higher, and the temperature, the atmospheric temperature, was about two degrees C warmer. So when you hear the debate about global climate change and targets for uh, how we want to limit our future global climate change, um, two degrees C, if we hit two degrees C, 
we might expect a sea level concomitant with that. <laughs> okay, I just took that word out of paper, so I just <laughs> threw it in the um, so, so I might have used it incorrectly. But uh, so, speaking of the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, this is these are some projections. This is a, a scenario projection. If we don't do anything different, here is if we start fixing stuff. Um, so again, by the end of the century, sea level might be about a meter higher. It might be higher than that. So if we get to two degrees C, I think this uh, assumes one, one and a half degrees C. Okay, so let's, let's look at this figure again and we can imagine, so here we have sea level rise, or sea level being a datum, you know, or a vertical datum. And so you can imagine that we might be able to use sea level to measure tectonics. So that's really, that's kind of what we were, we were going at. So we're in the interseismic period. Well, other people have done that, but there are some issues with their work. So here, this is Paul Vincent's work. He was a student of Ray Weldon's, but he didn't publish his thesis, so Ray got his, another student to publish it for him. So this is Mitchell et al. And this represents uplift, uh, tectonic uplift and tectonic substance along the margin. Here's California, here's Humboldt Bay five millimeters a year up is what they published in 1990. Five millimeters up, okay, remember that. Well, uh, Kellen, uh, Kellen Wong and, uh, Hi Hi so Hyman and Wong, 1995, they published a model of the subduction zone, and then Fluke came up and updated it a couple years later. And I really like this figure because it uses the same color for interseismic and for co-seismic. So if we look at Humboldt Bay, we're, uh, in this model, it's going up about four millimeters a year, right up. Um, up. And then uh, Wong, in 2003, updated their, mo they updated their model, and, uh, and here, this is interseismic um, uplift of, a, of more than two millimeters a year. So all of these show Humboldt Bay is going up. And so, Todd, Williams and I, I'm talking he's going to be here, um, we started looking at, the, at these data, data are plural except for in Star Trek, um, <laughs> and we realized that there was um, a mistake, that these people had applied their data mistakenly. And so here are the same data set, so here's Mitchell and Wong, and we'll see here arcaded redding, okay, arcaded redding. So does anyone know where 124 degrees longitude is? Yeah, Bob, where? It's pretty close to the coast. Yeah, it's pretty close to the coast. It's kind of where the 299 hits the 101. Mm -hmm. So it's a little west of where we are. So if this, so if this is Arcata, that's not Arcata. This is actually Burnt Ranch. So it's about 40 miles to the east of us. So, um, you know, I mentioned this to Kellen. He's like, what do you mean? I just used the data they gave me. So. <laughs> Um, their models were a little off. Fix them. They're a little off. Yeah. So, so here's a plot. Here's a here's a map, and there are all these little arrows that are pointing up or down. This is a summary of the tide gauge data from tide gauges along the coast. So here, um, we'll zoom in to Northern California. So in Crescent City, let me step back a, a bit. So. The uh, early 20th century sea level rise, you know, millimeter, millimeter and a half a year. Now it's accelerated. Uh, the, in Oregon, the late 20th century sea level rise is about two and a quarter millimeters a year. So, but in Crescent City, sea level is going down. Why is that? Students? Relatives. Yeah, land is going up. The land is going up, and so. That's why sea level is going down in Crescent City. Now, two and a quarter millimeters a year of sea level rise, the North Spit is at four and three quarter millimeter. So what's going on there? The ground's going down. Yeah, the ground's going down. So um, all those earlier uh, papers, they did talk about what was going on here. They would stop all their analysis at Crescent City because this was an anomaly, all right? And so we actually, you know, uh, so Todd Williams formed the Humble Bay Vertical Reference System Working Group, Humble Bay Vert for 
long. Here's our website where we publish all of our reports and stuff. And we decided to, you know, lots of different organizations, um, to study how the tectonics are controlling sea level um, in Humboldt Bay, in the Humboldt Bay area. And we got some money from the Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And, uh, and we contacted NOAA, and we'd like to get them in on our conversation. And we're like, oh, there's nothing wrong with the data. Okay, so here are some tide gauge sites that we use. The Crescent City Tide Gauge, which was installed in 1933. It's actually long enough record to do tidal analysis with. Uh, the North Spit was installed in 1977. It's not long enough uh, record. But we can compare the, these tide gauge data with the Crescent City data, and that's what um, others have done, like Reed Burgett, and he worked in Oregon. That's what he did for places that had a short record. So, this, so these two are continuously operating tide gauges. These other locations, these four other locations, are places that where NOAA had installed a tide gauge in the 70s, but they hadn't revisited there yet, all right, since then. And so we um, installed a tide gauge at Mad River Slough, and at Hookton Slough, and the Army Corps of Engineers hired this engineering firm, and they reoccupied the tide gauges in Samoa and Fields Landing. So Hookton Slough, Fields Landing, the North Spit, continuous Samoa. I don't know why Jeff called it SO, but we're stuck with that in Mad River Slough. So that's where we started collecting our data. Here's an example of the Hookton Slough tide gauge, College of the Redwoods, Highway 101, the South Bay, there's Hookton Slough, and the original tide gauge we think was installed here, and we installed tide gauge there, and we did a high precision survey to these tidal benchmarks to get the precision that we wanted. And if you're ever out in the bay and you see something like this, don't shoot it with your shotgun, it's a tide gauge. <laughs> All right, that's a big problem. So uh, Jeff Anderson did all of our uh, sea level analysis, tide gauge analysis. And uh, I put this up here to show that we looked at the monthly mean, and we also looked at the summer average. So this is an average of the three summer months. And this guy, this person, Komar, in 2011, published a paper where they present that this is a better way to analyze, analyze the sea level because it avoids the noise from the winter storms, all right? So, and the numbers aren't that much different, they are a little bit different. So here, uh, Crescent City, the sea level is going down, and the North Spit, the sea level is going up. So here's a summary of all of our tight gauge data. So we just looked at these, um, at these four plots, they're just arranged a little bit differently. And I mentioned that we have to link everything to Crescent City, so all of our analysis, anal all of our analyses are of tide gauge data loop through Crescent City in a way, and I'm not going to talk about that, all right? It's really complicated um, to save time. Um, so, but if what we do, if we subtract the North Spit tide gauge data from the Crescent City tide gauge data, we can figure out the relative land motion between Crescent City and the North Spit. And that's what, this, that's what these plots show. And what it shows is that Crescent City is going up relative to the North Spit at about five and a half, six millimeters a year. And then, um, and then these just show how we, uh, at these four other tide gauges, how we had observations in the 70s and 80s, or uh, late 70s, 77, 78, 79, and then in the early uh, 21st century. So even though we don't have continuous tide gauge data, enough time has a span, you know, enough time has lapsed that, that the vertical land motion change is significant enough to be able to measure it. Okay, so, oh shit! I might need some help here. No, I, I'm not a good joke teller. So, um, so these are, uh, after doing some analysis, so this is again Jeff Anderson and, you know, Monte Carlo, it sounds fancy, it just means that you do a calculation millions of times and it gets better. Um, but basically, so Crescent City, we have sea level, this is the local sea level, so the sea level observed at Crescent City uh, is going down, and these other locations are going up six millimeters a year in Hookton Slough. So, that's, so there's no wonder why the road floods all the time there. Um, and then if we subtract sea level rise, then we get our vertical land motion. 
So here we can see that Crescent City is going up at about 3 millimeters a year. Hooked and Slough is going down at almost 4 millimeters a year in the tide gauge data. So this is the highest rate of sea level rise in California, Oregon, and Washington. So be proud. <laughs> okay, so I spent a lot of time on the tide gauge data because we worked on that. We also are using GPS data and benchmark level data. So I know this is, uh, diff there's, we'll zoom in on the important parts of this map. But here's our area, here's Humboldt County, here's Humboldt Bay, and lots of our geodetic sites are right along the highway, Highway 101. So in, our, in, in the plots, the analysis um, we're gonna look at, we're gonna focus really mostly on um, sites that are along Highway 101, but we have GPS sites sprinkled about also. So, and uh, we'll go on. And here's the results. Um, that was fast. So uh, we'll zoom in, but um, the, 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 the colors that I'm using, red is going down, and green's going up, like the leaves on a tree, okay? So all the symbols that have green symbols, those areas are going up. So let's, and, and remember, these are completely independent data sets. So let's zoom into Humboldt Bay. And so we can see, indeed, Humboldt Bay is going down. And, and uh, as soon as we get out of Humboldt Bay, um, the ground is, is going up. So here we are, hooked and slew about three and a half millimeters down. Our benchmarks um, exceed that substance rate a little bit. And some of these benchmarks are on bedrock, and some of them are in mud. So it doesn't appear that uh, the geology is, is controlling that. All right. Oh yeah, here we'll zoom in closer. That's what I was going to do. So, 3.9, 4.0, 3.4. Um, this is in bedrock, and these are out in the bottom land. So, um, doesn't look like the geology is controlling that, but we haven't done you know extensive analysis. Oh great. Okay. So, <laughs> these are complicated plots, but we'll walk through it, and we'll ignore the stuff that doesn't make sense. All right, you're all students, right? Okay, so um, vertical land motion, both of these vertical land motion in millimeters per year, all right, so six to minus six. This is east-west, east-west, and, um, and remember our figure risk model of the subduction zone? Yeah. Well, we think that we see this westward down trend. These these data are from Crescent City, so they're going up, and so we're going to ignore those. And so we think we see a Cascadia subduction zone uh, fault locking symbol, si signal here. So it's, it's the finger, it's being pulled down. So that's really exciting, but it gets more exciting. Mm -hmm. All right. We also see, so this is north to south, we also see that in the Humboldt Way area, this uh, Cascadia down signal. Mm -hmm. um, but that's really not the exciting thing, and we're going to get there shortly. I mean, it is exciting, but discovery is even more exciting. Okay. Now, even though Bloom's taxonomy has discovery as the lowest level of learning, it may still be the most important part of learning, I think, because it's the most fun. All right, so here's one of the really exciting things that we noticed, is that you can see that there's lots of noise here. But one of the things that we noticed is that there is a discrete offset, thanks Mark for that great word, there's a discrete offset in vertical land motion rates from here to here. See how the rates here is about four millimeters a year of uplift, here is about two millimeters a year of uplift. So there's an offset there in these vertical land motion rates. And I found um, seven of these discrete offsets in vertical land motion rates. But we're going to focus on this one and we're also going to, first, we're going to look at here, this one here. And, and uh, did I mention that these, have, these offsets happen where there are known active faults? Mm -hmm. Okay, good, thanks. Um, <laughs> two of them happen in places where there are not known active faults. So we're going to get there in a moment. But first, we're going to look at this location here, um, where the geodetic data crossed the little salmon fault, one of the most active faults in the area. So here's a world famous map from Harvey Kelsey. And I just threw this in, I just uh, placed this in here 
um, conspicuously to show that we have lots of crustal faults. So here is the, uh, the Mad River Fault Zone, which we'll talk about momentarily. And then here's the Little Salmon Fault. And you're like, oh, that's a map. I don't quite get it. So here's an older map from uh, Gary and Bud, uh, 1992. And so here's Humboldt Bay, uh, Humboldt State's up here somewhere. And uh, these red lines, I just uh, drew these in, drafted these in here. And these are generally where there are five main faults, main active faults in the Mad River Fault Zone. And here's a cross section going from there to there. And we can see that these are compressional thrust faults. They're all dipping to the north, so they're south vergent. Um, and so that's what the map that uh, Harvey had shows is there are a whole bunch of these thrust faults, and they're all over the place. So, but this is the Mad River Fault Zone. So yeah, we have the Fickle Hill Fault, the Mad River Fault, the McKinleyville Fault, the Blue Lake Fault, and the Trinidad Fault. And we found um, geodetic data for the Fickle Hill Fault and the Trinidad Fault. The Blue Lake Fault doesn't come out to where we are. But, um, so let's, uh, let's look at that little salmon fault. So here again, this is McLaughlin's map uh, over a 10 meter DEM hillshade. And so here are these Mad River Fault <laughs> Zone faults. Um, and then here's the little salmon fault. So we're going to zoom in, let's see, right here, and look at the geodetic data here to look at um, how the ground is moving around the little salmon fault. So we'll zoom in, but um, in these comparisons, we have the map where we'll look at the, where the, the geodetic sites are, and then we have some profiles. So let's, let's go through that. Um, we'll zoom in. So, um, so again, here's the Little Salmon Fault. And what I've done is I've taken the geodetic sites, the site, geodetic sites on the foot wall, and I have laid, I've colored those blue. So again, vertical land motion in millimeters a year, north to south. Mm -hmm. So these are the foot wall sites. And I've colored the hanging wall sites the uh, sites on the top part of the fault yellow, and so these are the hanging wall sites. So you can see that there's this offset in vertical land motion rates, right? And so I've calculated what's called a vertical separation rate. So that means like if we have two blocks and one's moving up relative to another vertically, we can measure that rate. It's called a vertical separation rate. So that's what I've done here. I've done it in two ways. I've uh, taken the average of these rates, and that's the green dot, and I did the same here. The average of the yellow sites is that green dot. And then I just difference those rates. So that's, I'm calling that the block estimate. And that assumes there's no internal deformation, there are no faults that I've missed, and those are probably false assumptions, but I don't know. And then uh, to satisfy my concerns about my false assumptions, I decided to do um, what I'm calling a single offset rate, and that is just to set to what's the difference between the two closest sites. And we can see that these rates aren't that much different. So, um, so based on our measurements, it looks like that one that the ground on one side of the Little Salmon Fault is moving up two millimeters a year relative to the other. Now we don't know if. Um, if one side's going down and the other side's not going up, and one side's going up and the other side's, we don't know. It's just relative. Hey, Gary? But, yeah. Are the, the gray data, are they off, off of the profile? Is Thanks that... for asking. That's right. So um, I, I included all the data on, that we have on the plot. And the, um, so let's see if I can find an example. Well, let's say there is a GPS site over here. Yeah, right. I don't want to include that right. in my analysis. And let's say I have some uh, campaign GPS data where people just went out there and has a high uncertainty, large uncertainty. So I'm not incorporating data that has a large uncertainty. Like these, this is our one sigma error, one sigma uncertainty on all of these measurements. And so this has a really large uncertainty. Same with that one. So I'm not including those. Thanks. All right. Now, this is where it gets exciting. 
Okay, I know I probably have already said that, but it, it, it just gets more and more exciting. It does. You just wait. Okay. So here we have, so the Little Salmon Fall, we're traveling further south. There's the Van Dusen River, and Jay Stallman's here. We'll talk about the Van Dusen momentary. Oh, wait. No, he did the Elk River. Never mind. But Jay Stallman's still here. Um, so here's the Van Dusen River. Here's the Eel River going up. It turns into the South Fork and the main stem. And here is one of these main fa major faults in the area, the Rust Fault. Now, uh, Ogle in 1953, McLaughlin in 2000, many others have mapped this as a fault that dips to the south and it pushes, it lifts up Franciscan rocks above the Wildcat and Yager, these younger rocks. So the old rocks are lifted above younger rocks, which is sort of how you view thrust faults generally, and, uh, and it's dipping to the south, so that means that this is going up. So if we looked at a profile, this would have, if, if, if we were measuring motion on the thrust fault, the, the data would show up on the south, all right? Um, because the geodetic, there is an offset between these sites and these sites, there is an offset. So that's why we're talking about it. So we'll, uh, we'll zoom in. And again, we did the blue on the foot wall and yellow on the hanging wall. Which side's up? North. North side's up. Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> so, so either the rust fault isn't behaving like every other thrust fault that we know of, or maybe the rust fault used to be going up in one direction, now it's going up in the other direction which could happen, or it could be, you know, scissoring. There are all these hypotheses, or there is a different fault out there. And so that's certainly a possibility. Perhaps it's dipping to the north. Perhaps it's dipping to the north. But that would, does a map, the, the problem with that, yeah, or it could be dipping to the north. Now, that would violate all the geologic mapping that's been done, but it could. So it's important to include all of the alternate hypotheses because the mapping could be wrong, right? So it is good to include all of our alternative hypotheses. So what I've done here is I've taken the published geometries of the fault, and so I've taken our vertical separation rates, and I've converted that by the dip on the fault for a slip rate. All right, so we have vertical separation, we have the dip of the fault, so now we have a slip rate on the fault. And these are those slip rates, the block offset and single offset, for our seven geodetic faults, okay, from south to north. And two of these, the La Sosente fault and the Eureka fault, these are newly discovered faults, all right? They didn't um, exist before this. So um, get your glasses out. So let's look at, I'll highlight the numbers that you really want to look at. So these are our geodetic slip rates um, using the block and the single offsets. We're going to compare them to geologic rates. Now these geologic rates are based on marine terraces that are as old as about a quarter million years. And they're also based on the offset of an unconformity that's about a half a million years. So these are, you know, two to 500,000 year old rates and also include paleoseismic evidence rates that are on the order of 10,000 years. So these are longer time scale. These are 1980 to 2010, 2020. So these are like decadal rates and these are geologic rates. So um, Pat McCrory, so she compiled everyone else's data and published it. And so um, she compiled it and included the entire Mad River fault zone as one system and came up with a slip rate of about five millimeters a year. If we look at our Trinidad and Fickle Hill, which are the two faults in the Mad River fault zone that we've identified, if you add that up, that's also 4.9. Um, this is 6.6, .6, so just the different methods. So they're about the same number, right? We're geologists, we're not engineers. And then <laughs> Bull Salmon Fault, again, these are about the same number that is the geologic rate. Now, that is just, that shouldn't be, right? This is just <laughs> crazy, okay? But that's, that's what it is. And then um, here's the Eureka Fault. So we get uh, two and a half millimeters a year on the Eureka Fault, and uh, two to three millimeters a year 
on this new La Sacete fault. So, um, of course, they didn't have it earlier. So, very exciting. Um, so, Tom Leroy, my friend, who I was hoping was going to be here also because I was going to, you know, harass him a little bit. So, he was, uh, um, gosh, I'm going to make fun of him. He's not even here. Do it, do it, do it. Okay. So, he, he came over to my house and uh, his kids were out in the car complaining that they were hungry. And he's like, no, nah, you can wait 15 minutes. And this is completely a fabricated story. But uh, he came over to my house and we started, like, we started thinking, you know, there's got to be another fault. So what we did was um, we started looking at the data that we had available. So um, a lot, lots of this, from now on, everything I'm doing, I didn't spend any money to do. All right? There is a main, there's gigaflops of free data out there. All right? So if you're looking for a project, try to find some existing data, because then you don't need to pay for it. All right. So this is 10 meter DEM. Hill shade is our artificially lit um, with a sun angle coming from the northwest because that's what the psychologists think we usually interpret. And so here's the rust fault, the map rust fault. Here's Scotia, Scotia Bluffs. Um, and let's see, and here's Shively. And so Tom and I just started looking for lineaments. You know, you can kind of start seeing these lineaments, you know, but it's kind of, uh, well, let's see, it's, uh, it's equivocal. You don't know. You know, what's causing that lineament? It could be an artifact from the map that they used to create this, because this is made out of, from a contour map that was simplified. So we kind of thought we might have seen something. So here we zoom in the Shively. This is the source of data for that DEM, are these contours. And we didn't really see anything here, but look at that. We thought we saw a uh, this here, there's a shadow there because the light's coming from that direction. So we kind of thought we saw something here, a feature, and we started measuring profiles in our GIS. And indeed, there is this little bump in topography here, um, but it's really a course data set. Now, I had a meeting with the USGS the next morning. It was a 10-15 meeting on the Skype thing they have or whatever. And uh, that night, I discovered that Bill Dietrich he had flown high precision topography LIDAR for, from the mouth of the eel all the way up to the headwaters of the South Fork. So I let that download overnight, it's like 35 gigs. And in the morning, I'm like, okay, I mosaic them all. I created these, hill sh these derivative products. And uh, 15 more minutes before the meeting that I was going to be presenting something else about, I finally loaded the map. And this is our high resolution topography here. Oh, I should have been more educational about it, but whatever. And so <laughs> here we can see that topographic landform is creating a shadow. Um, we also see here we have these flat surfaces. These are, um, this is the floodplain of Shively. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Susan. Susan suggested that I uh, locate the, um, a Native American name for this area. And the Sinkion had a village here called La Sacete. And if anyone wants to help me pronounce that better, um, I would welcome that. So there was a Sinkion village here. Um, anyhow, so here's the, here's the floodplain. And these are older remnant, older floodplains that have been um, relatively lifted up, or the river has incised down. And, uh, and then we have you know, a couple intermediate. So these are old river terraces. And, and so here's this topographic scarp that's cutting across all of these river terraces. Um, so, pretty cool. Um, and that lines up with the rust, kind of, maybe? So the rust fault is off the map. The rust fault is mapped down here. But so, it's got the right motion. Um, but this, yeah, this has the right motion for our geodetic data. Right. Um, Let's see. Now, now this terrace here is about 100 meters above the river. I gotta move on. <laughs> so here we're zooming in. Beautiful. Okay. Zoom out. Um, don't just use hill shades. Use whatever you can. So this is a slope shade. Hill shades I don't like because they're biased to the sun angle, but they're things people are most familiar with. So I always like to do hill shades. 
I like to do slope shades. This is just um, the, how steep the slope is, and then I put an aspect. So um, the, the, the orientation of the topography relative to the compass, you get a different color. And uh, it really pops out things, so I'm not going to go into that anymore. But uh, visualization is where it's at. So I mapped, the next step was I mapped the geomorphology so I'm of the area to try to understand the structural relations of the fault and all these different things that are going on. So I have these terraces, the terrace risers, and I gave them terrace numbers. You always want to start with one as your youngest feature because you're more likely to misidentify the older features. So this is terrace seven, this is terrace two, three, and four. And use creative colors to help visualize. And then three days later, I'm like, I gotta go down there. I drove down there to take a picture. So I drove down here and there's a road right there and I took a picture looking at this scarp. And here's the photo. So here's this barn sitting on this flat spot and these houses sitting up on that flat spot. That used to be the same flat spot. That house is about eight meters higher than this. Huge. You can actually see the older terrace, the tree line from the older terrace. So the 20 meter, 15 to 20 meter scarp is up there. Pretty cool. I use Jay Stallman's um, incision rate um, from the Elk River terraces. And uh, which was very similar to Frank Bickner's incision rate in Garberville. And I used that incision rate to estimate the age of these terraces. So I took the elevation of the terrace, I subtracted the elevation of the floodplain to get what's called the relative elevation. And, and then I used the, this incision rate, how, how fast the river's cutting into that surface, to come up with um, an age estimate. So those older terraces are about 100,000 years old. And these younger terraces are 20 to 30,000 years old. Now, this is just imaginary, right? But it's free. <laughs> um, so the next step is, so here's terrace T7. And we can see there's this, there's this strath terrace, this uh, uh, about 50 meters of fluvial sediments that are deposited on top of an angular unconformity into the wildcat. So I'm going to be uh, trying to get some exposure ages, OSL, beryllium, or chlorine ages of those sediments to get a better idea of the longer term slip rate. I then uh, um, measured some profiles across the scarp. Here we have those, um, this, the, the size of the scarps. And then I used the age of those terraces, the measurement of the scarp height to come up with vertical separation rate. And I know the dip of the fault because I can measure it on the LIDAR to come up with a slip rate. So the mean slip rate is about a third of a millimeter a year and it doesn't change much on the 100,000 to 30,000 year time scale. So it scales with the age of the terrace. Oh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> I have more slides if people ask questions that I think we should go to the slides. But, um, there we go. There we go. So, anyone have any questions? Supposed to be a student. Student. But your lifelong learning. No, I'm joking. Oh yeah. So oh, I don't bite. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I won't bite. Yes. Oh, you're not. Uh, but he always asks good questions. But he also asks good know, questions. Know. Okay. Uh, um, your short term separates. You're comparable to your geological subplates and so on. Which is very surprising because the geological should include the earthquakes, whereas your, 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 your short term is probably just creep. It may be. That, that's something that we don't know. We don't know. So, what, uh, so what, Donna, what Donna's talking about is so the faults might be locked, and, which causes some <coughs> vertical land motion. Or they might be slipping or creeping, which means that they're not locked. So we don't know if our geodetic rates are because the faults are slipping or if it's because the faults are locked. That's true. And what we, let's see here. So um, one way that we would be able to test that is, um, is, um, 
if, if uh, so right now, like let's say this is the fault, I'm just going to make the ground flat. This is the fault. We have data, this is like, that's, that, that's like an example of our data set. It's really sparse. Okay. Now if, if, for example, we had a lot more data, like if we had a geology student who wanted to go out and survey this a couple times, and if we had a whole bunch of data, and the data, oh, I should have put that higher, if the data looked like that, it would, it then, then this is a slipping fault, it's aseismic. If, for example, here I'll just do it down here, if our data looked something like um, that, then that would suggest that the, that the crust is deforming elastically and that the fault is locked. And so we could actually look at the geometry of the curvature of this data plot to figure out how deep the fault was locked and all that sort of stuff. I'm not an expert at that, but I will learn how to do that when we get the data to do that. But I know conceptually that's what we would need to do to, to work out whether or not it's aseismic or if those are locked. Now, five of the seven faults we know um, are capable of creating earthquakes. So we know that five of those seven faults are locked, but we don't know if our geodetic you know, represents them being locked. or Because or, so, some faults are aseismic and locked at the same time, like the Hayward Fault. So there was a recent swarm down on the Hayward Fault. The Hayward Fault has the highest likelihood based on prehistoric evidence, has the highest probability of failure in the Bay Area, like 35% in the next 37 years or whatever. And, um, but the, the interesting thing about the Hayward Fault is that there are regions on the Hayward Fault, all right, so let's say the darker areas are the locked areas, but they're all, and then this, this area is creeping. Um, there are earthquakes here and there are earthquakes here. So it's really, Hayward Fault's very interesting, whereas like on the San Andreas Fault, there is a section of the San Andreas Fault that is creeping, but it doesn't have earthquakes. So the San Andreas Fault and the Hayward Fault are very different. And so we don't know if our faults, you know, where our faults fit into the sort of seismic and aseismic. Um, we, the data we're use, that we're using were for building a highway, and not for studying an active fault. So, so it's just good to know that we don't know. And when you use the word active, there's a legal meaning, and then there's the geological. Yeah. So, so, um, so active means lots of different things. So in the state of California, there are some laws that regulate what is it's called a Holocene active fault. And so um, there are regulations that stipulate where you can build if you're in an active fault zone. and you have to do all these studies, Alquist Criola, right? Alquist Criola, law. Well, it was from the uh, um, 1970s uh, Silmar Quake, Criolo um, law, and that requires us to identify all the active faults, Holocene active faults, which means that they ruptured in the last 12,000 years. Um, schools and hospitals, you have to go further back in time, I think it's 50,000 years. I'm going to have to know that in the next few weeks. <laughs> um, so for example, the, the, um, all right, if we look at the, um, the Las Asante Fault, let's see here, let me just go back to this one here. So we don't know if this scarp is, is, uh, create, generates earthquakes, Earth is a seismic. We don't know that on this either. However, I suspect that this is uh, capable of generating earthquakes. Um, if we take the, the low slip rate, a third of a millimeter a year, and if we say that this is you know, 10,000 years, there should be um, you know, one, to two mil, one to two meter scarp out here in the floodplain. And um, if we look at the Actually, this is where the aspect slope map is really good. I, I just, I have, I've drawn lots of profiles. I don't see a scarp out there. So, um, 
So I'm using that evidence to, to suggest that this is um, um, an active fault capable of generating earthquakes. This summer, uh, Ashley Strag, my friend, she teaches at Portland State. She's got ground pen train radar device. And we're going to go out here. These are all public roads. And we're going to you know, search in the subsurface. So that's the next step, subsurface geophysics. Lots of this property, this property here, is all uh, Hubble Redwoods Company. So we're going to try and do some profiles up there. There are two parcels here. Try to get access to those. But um, so you're going to put it in Alpha's Priola. This is possibly uh, Alpha's an AP fault. Yeah. And um, well, well, you should know that from the age of the use terrace. Can well, we yeah. That's yeah. That's, that's yeah. So if this if this terrace is younger than twelve thousand years. But you did generally say it, didn't you? No, it's just an estimate based on incision rates. So yeah. I don't, there's no yeah, based on installment, we can't believe estimate? that. <laughs> um, my, the estimate is that this is, this is somewhere between 20 and, and um, 40,000 years oh. old. So, but. Where's your, your 100,000 year surface? This is the 100,000 year surface right here, and there's a little remnant right there. So, yeah. For what it's worth, Frank Dickner's thesis, he just retired so it's it that old. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just he, talked about it. He, it uh, he worked on a ranch right out of Gar Gar uh, yeah, Mitchell Mitchell Ranch. Ranch. Right. And yeah. I think he had nine terraces in there, and based on soils, we thought there were three Holocene age terraces, and they went back to 105. And yeah. that very quick flash of numbers that came through, it, it looked like very similar kinds of um, ages for flight terraces. Yeah, very similar, absolutely. And his, um, the rate that he published in the FOP guidebook and in his thesis ranges from about 2 millimeters a year to about 0.9 millimeters a year. So that could make these a little bit younger. Um, but we really need some numerical ages of the sediment. How old is that sediment? And that will help us be more confident in our rates. So that's the next step. Geophysics, uh, numerical ages for the sediments, do some fault trenching to look at look for evidence for uh, uh, earthquakes that have offset geologic units. Um, I think those are the next steps. You know, Jay, just a comment on your slide there. It, it seems like the, the terrace um, with Shively on it, um, it has a lot of uh, channel parallel um, yeah. figures, so it's probably been disrupted by, yeah. I would think, the higher flow, so maybe that's why you don't see your scarf out. Well, Shively Creek's cutting across the... the yeah. 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 yeah, and it and it cuts over there. Um, it just look, it, the, it, yeah. yeah, it's been modified. Yeah. And it, but, you know, and it's been farmed a lot. Yeah. So, where is, where is but, 64 flood? Yeah, yeah. 64. so 64 flood, so I don't have photos from here, but I looked at some photos from here. This is the mouth of Larrabee Creek. And T1, so the, the, um, the flooding in here matches pretty well with, this is the FEMA flood zone AE, which is the 100 year you know, return period yeah. flood. And this is the 500 year return period okay. flood. Yeah. So, so from a hydrologic perspective, yeah. we wouldn't call this a terrace, but from a geomorphology, I'm, I'm labeling it, a, a t I'm giving it a T number. Um, but this, you know, this area is flooded. Now, flooding doesn't, you know, there probably wasn't a lot of um, uh, coarser than mud sediment transported here during the 1964 Why? flood. I don't, I don't know, maybe there was. <laughs> I don't know, Tom Lyle, what do you think? I think you're probably right, because with all the abrasion of soft bed load going down there, it turns to find some. Yeah, so, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't really know. If you, you know. have one photo, those channels, are they, are they in mud? Um, so whether or not this, you know, how long ago was that riser formed? I have no idea. I don't know. You need a shovel. I need a shovel. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, absolutely. This remember I I discovered this on October 2nd. So this is like 3 months old. 
and I haven't spent any money. And you still haven't gotten over it. I still haven't gotten over it. I'm so <laughs> excited about it. <laughs> How far back does geodetics go? Those are kind of real time, but they're only Three decades. Okay. So 30 to 40 years is the geodetic data. So Jay, can you tell yes. us anything about your other unknown fault that you discovered? Oh, the Eureka fault? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, I have some slides for that. So um, I'll skip that. So here's the Eureka fault. And so uh, it's a little more complicated. I'm not going to go into the, the so you know. So where, where exactly is it? So here's a map, Arcadia Eureka, and I think it comes right through Eureka, right through there. All right, and uh, it's kind of near the axis it's, of the It's um, well, it, the you know, uh, it's not really the anticline. It's not really folded that well. So where is the axis? I don't know, um, but it's there's some coincidences. This is all. This is where the bay gets it next down. Mm -hmm. right. This is where we have our three largest islands in the bay. Right. This is also north of here. The sand dunes get over 70 feet in elevation. South of here, the sand dunes barely reach 30 feet in elevation. Usually about 20 feet oh, in elevation. Okay. So there are all these coincidences. And then offshore, here's a seismic line, and there's some <laughs> faulting in the offshore Brilliant. at about the right location. Now this is from Stratiform, it's older data. It's Janet so Watt right? and Danny Brothers, they did some new seismic lines, they did some boomer and side, you know, some deeper penetrating seismic work and better chirp uh, profiles. This is a site, the chirp shallow seismic profile. So now that she is off furlough, she'll in a month get back to me and we'll take a look at the newer seismic data to see you know, because it's kind of hard to interpret. So why is this seismic line short there? It doesn't reach your reach. Maybe yeah, so does the there. fault, yeah, maybe this, this might not be it. I don't know. This is just, I'm just uh, spaghetti al dente. Yeah. The wall. <laughs> so there's some coincidences. Um, that's, that's why this wasn't in the slide presentation. <laughs> There's also gas coming out there, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Danny was there when they collected this data set. I'm sorry. I'm like, hey, Danny. Okay. Yeah. Hey. So Danny presented this in his thesis, his master's thesis here at Humboldt State. Sorry, Danny. <laughs> no apologies necessary. Awesome. So, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on here. So hopefully with the new data, we might be able to see. And, and they, you know, they surveyed further north. So, um, I don't know. When I, I interpreted that fault as Oh, that's the other thing. Jay Stallman I, I, saw I, some uh, river meanders here that changed. And deformation of the stage two. The terrace. Profile, the yeah. river terraces. So, Jay Stallman worked on the river terraces here. Let's see, the Elk River. Right that's the Elk River, yeah. Elk River and freshwater, too, right? But the the um, oh, but point I... to the structure that trends in into that valley. Let's see if um oh, here let's go to the top on one because that might uh... unemployment done wonders for our geology you knowledge. Like... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. No, it's not zoomed in enough, but. Um... There's a change in the behavior of the river and the wavelength, right? The meander wavelength. There is. And it looks like, so Jay Stallman was the, one of the first persons to hypothesize that there's a fault going through here. And it also, I'm sorry, I meant to mention this. So that's one other coincidence is that, um, that there is, so the meander length change and also the, if you look at a profile, the river, right? The river, there's an offset right in the river profile there is and we've been working in the in the lower part of the valley now and see um, a convexity in the in the valley bottom ah that i it could be explained in a variety of ways but but again point to this to the to the the structure that's mapped on that figure that it that's right around the dt and humble yeah you mean the uh, right there well that's right the north oh fault. so here this is the north spit fault yeah and it's part of the little salmon uh, uh, fault zone, at yeah. least uh, it's in <coughs> California uh, and US Geos 
databases as part of the little salmon fall. Um, any student questions? I'm not going to bite <laughs> yet, unless you ask. Don't ask a question. And I'm going to start biting. See, I'm not a teacher, so I could say those things. Yeah. Um, can you go back to the slide with the, um, the triangle showing the sea level rise uh, after the subduction zone? Um, not that one? No. Is that the uh, red and the uh, This one? Green oh, the red. Triangle? Oh! Yeah. This one here. That one? Yeah. Awesome. Um, so, I'm picturing the subduction zone kind of like like a Pringles potato chip passing by Humboldt Bay. Okay. And uh, I was just wondering if those levels, if, if there's any previous data showing fluctuation in, in those sea levels, so um, the kind of U shape uh, changes over time. We only have really some data for the tight ages. We have some data from the 70s, 77, 78, and then 2008, 2010. 2010. Um, so we don't have um, like enough data to see how it might change through time there. We do have uh, the North Spit data, and we can, um, we can look at that. Um, but the, so here's the North Spit data, and we take out the noise and we just look at the summer. Um, there, there could be, you know, I'm not a um, mathematician, so um, like I need Amanda Meyer to come up here and do some sort of, you know, spectral analysis or whatever she would do with her brilliant mind to look at if there is any sort of um, very, you know, uh, cyclic cyclicity or something like that. I don't understand where your question is. Uh, what's the Pringles thing? Oh. <laughs> uh, maybe I don't understand or I'm picturing it wrong. No, that's all right. Uh, because uh, the land, the sea level shows that the land is higher at all levels depending on where you are, north, north, to south. Right? Um, Let's see, let's go back to the red and green yeah, triangle. Yeah, I, was, I was thinking about the little uh, hand arm thing you did. Uh huh. The subduction zone. Yeah, okay. So so parts of the ground are going down and parts of them are going up. Right. And so the red ones are probably sort of like where the finger is. Why don't you do it? Though? Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, oh, like there is. Yeah. Yeah. I know, you want me to do it this way? No! <laughs> oh, now I'm I can't so do that other thing. Remember the story short thing? Okay, I'm dyslexic. So, um, yeah, so the, the red ones are the fingers and the green ones the going up. Um, oh, okay, yeah, that makes more sense. Is that if your hand were a Pringle? Yeah. Yeah. That's the Pringle. Right. Yeah. That's the Pringle. I saw. I still You just substitute a Pringle for your fingers. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, -uh it doesn't. Yeah. It's too brittle. It's too brittle. Yeah. It's okay. Does that help? You should come out to dinner and we'll talk more. Uh, I'll bring a piece of paper. And Pringles. <laughs> and Pringles. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs>